Well, it looked like Oregon was going to get a five-star in Elijah Rushing, and then they didn't. But then they picked up a pair of four-star linebackers. So are they all out on five stars in the 2024 class? The answer is no. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you haven't already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, wherever you're listening to or watch the show. I appreciate you, whoever and wherever you're listening to this show right now. Lots to get to. Oregon's got a new commit in 2024. We've got a new university president as well. Does that change anything on the realignment front? College football playoff, lots to get to on today's show. But we're going straight into the mailbag, which you can always be a part of. YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at locked on ducks. DMs and mentions wide open. This from Darius. Rushing seemed to be, that's Elijah Rushing, the most likely five-star player to sign with Oregon. Now that he might not be joining the Ducks, so this was asked before he committed or, uh, to Arizona, do you think Oregon will land any five-star in this class? And if they don't, do you think they will remain in the top 10 without one when it is all set and done? So a couple things. I don't think that he is the only five-star Oregon had a chance at. I thought they had a good chance at him. Because I talked to people who were tapped in on the recruiting front, and Oregon did have a good chance there. It just didn't end up going their way. And look, I I won't say I'd written it off in my head as like, yeah, he is a duck. Let's you know tally it on the board because you can never know with this sort of stuff. But I was very much in the mindset of yeah, Oregon looks like they're in a really really good position here. They've been after this kid for a long time. They've gotten him on campus. He's liked it and everything like that. And he just ended up going to to Arizona in, instead. And props to Jed Fish and his staff for pulling out all the stops to get him there. Because you can bet that Oregon and Tennessee wanted him really badly because he can be a high-impact day one kind of player and he won't be a duck. But I don't think that Oregon is out on five-star recruits completely in 2024. In fact, I still expect them to land at least one, if not two, maybe three. I think without rushing... It's hard to see a path where they could get to three. I'll talk with Brian Smith uh, more on that on on tomorrow's show and get his insight there. But it seems like rushing was you know kind of the first big one that they made a push for, right? The first recruiting battle they were actively in on, down to the final few, coming down to the final moments and such, doesn't go their way. I think the most they can probably end up with is two. And you're looking at names like Williams Nuaneri the number one overall defensive lineman. You're looking at names like Aiden Breland, who's a top three or four defensive lineman in the class. You're looking at names like Jordan Ross, who's a five-star edge. You're looking at names like Justin Williams, a five-star linebacker. Oregon's got a pair of linebackers now in the 2024 cycle. But I, I think that when you look at what, what Oregon has done and what it seems they are capable of on the recruiting trail, no, this is not the only five-star Oregon was uh, was going to go after. But I, and, and Brandon Baker, by the way, number one offensive tackle. Oregon's going to continue to be in the mix there. Now, would it be disappointing if Oregon didn't land at least one five-star, if not two, in the 2024 class after landing a couple in uh, last year's class, picking up Josh Connerly as well? Like We've already seen this staff have a propensity to go out and get the, the creme de la creme of, of high school recruits, which is what you need if you want to build a championship roster. But if they don't end up getting one, you can still have a top 10 class. Now, it's going to be a lot harder if Oregon doesn't do that because you'll have other schools that that do get those sorts of kids and it does pull up their their class average and having a five-star kit means a a good amount. I'd be pretty surprised and frankly a tad disappointed if with all the five stars that Oregon is going after, all those individual players, they don't end up with at least one. I think one to two is probably what we are looking at there. But that class can still be in the top 10. So the highest rated, like even if they didn't get one, I mean, the highest rated class in program history, or excuse me, in program history, before it was a program, now we have a program, of course, was 2021. It finished sixth nationally. It had a a ridiculously high uh, composite rating on on 24-7. So that's the, the gold standard, so to speak. That's kind of the mark that Oregon 
is shooting for here to eventually beat. If they, if Dan Lanning wants to have the title of the head coach who brought in the highest rated recruiting class in program history. But that class, interestingly enough, didn't have a single five star in it. It didn't, which is crazy to think about. They had some really highly rated players. They had kids who were, you know, on the cusp of of being five stars or who might have, you know, had a five star ranking from uh, this service or that service, but just not from 24 seven. But 24 seven is what I go off of. I find them uh, to be the most reliable, consistent, easy to use. Not that other services aren't uh, perfectly fine to use. I've just I've always been a 24 seven guy. That's kind of where, where where I go to for that sort of stuff. But you know, 2021, you had Dante Thornton, you had Troy Franklin, who were like right there. You had Kingsley Suamatia, who, you know, again, was right there. You had Ty Thompson, who was on the cusp. Like, you know, Ty Thompson, a great example. Was he a five-star? Was he not a five-star? Eh, you know, that sort of stuff is a semantical difference at that point in time. But having players of that caliber, that's what you need in order to pull in a top 10 class. And it doesn't have to automatically be a five-star kid. Now, given where you know, kids are ranked right now in 24 seven sports and given where Oregon's class is and given the fact that they're landing these blue chip commitments, for, which is a four or five star recruit, and they've gotten Dylan Williams and Kamar Mathuti in, uh, in the last several days and their class ranking hasn't moved nationally. My guess is that they would need at least one five star to stay in the mix because if they keep piling up the four stars, then you might fall out of the top 10. And look, if you're number 12, instead of number nine, at the end of the day, is that a massive difference? No, there's the, you know, headline component of saying like, oh, you know, pulled in back to back top 10 classes. That does mean something. Historically, the recruiting level you have to be at to not just get to the playoff, but win a national championship is pretty darn high. But Oregon also has the highest blue chip ratio right now. And it looks like they'll continue to have that going forward in the Pac-12 uh, compared to anybody in the conference. And it's about 67% and you have to be over uh, 51% historically to be in the national championship conversation doesn't mean if you're there you're automatically good enough to do that because Auburn for instance has got the blue chip ratio over 50 percent anybody picking them to win the national championship win the SEC go to the playoff anybody anybody Bueller Bueller no probably not so I mean they get year one with uh, Hugh Freeze and whatnot I don't know who's playing quarterback down there uh might be Robbie Ashford our old uh, our old pal good guy Fast player boy. I don't know if you watched any of Robbie Ashford, just real quick. He's fast. He's 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 dual threat quarterback and he's got the running part down. Needs to refine his game uh in the throwing department, but he is really, really, really fast. But anyway, so back to Oregon's class here. They're still in play for several five stars. I expect them to be able to get one. That's the standard that Lanning and company have set is you should be pulling in those sorts of kids every year. And if you want to be a dominant team in the conference if you want to be the clemson of the pac-12 if you want to be in the college football playoff year in and year out the national championship picture year in and year out you have to be able to get those sorts of kids the big time schools the ohio states the georgias the lsus alabamas of the world they're getting those kids for a reason because they are making a tangible impact on the field in a way that some other kids just can't doesn't mean there aren't great recruits up and down a recruiting class you can go back in every Oregon recruiting class, find kids who are closer to the bottom who have turned into, you know, big time stars. Like Marcus Harper, for instance, was one of the lower rated recruits in his class. Guy has been a key contributor for the Ducks over the last couple of seasons, especially last year when we were undergoing injuries on the offensive line. He played a huge, huge role in the offensive line still being really good. And he'll be a player on the offensive line who will make an impact this year as well. So, uh, to answer your question here, Darius, I, I don't think they can remain in the top 10 without a five-star, but I do expect them to get at, at least one. But the most recent commitment they got was Kamar Mathuti, who didn't do anything for Oregon's recruiting class necessarily. Does that mean he can't do anything? <laughs> Absolutely, positively not. You can do something at FanDuel, though, and that's go get in on the Major League Baseball action if you have not already. When you do so, you can get 10 times your first bet in bonus bets up to $200 when you take your first swing at betting the Major League Baseball, the Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball, however you want to phrase it. When you bet that on FanDuel, you can get that no sweat first bet. Just 20 bucks, you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or 
lose. That's 200 you could spend betting everything for the money line, over under, Oregon's over under win total, Bonex to win the Heisman, whatever you want, you can find it on FanDuel all in an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get paid instantly, and there's no better place to bet Major League Baseball than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sign up today. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Nice quick little second segment sip. And we keep going. So Kamar Mathudi commits to the Ducks. He was looking at other places like Washington, like Michigan State, which, as I always say, is a great barometer to indicate not just what you should expect from the kid, but also kind of the value of the recruitment, right? So for Arizona, for instance, they went up against Oregon and Tennessee and got a five-star kid. That's a big deal for Arizona. And for Oregon to go up against Washington, who you lost to last year, but is going to be a perennial contender going forward in the Pac-12, and a team like Michigan State that's got a good defensive head coach in in Mel Tucker. I wonder what will happen with Michigan State this year. Because they were a pretty big disappointment last year. They went 11-2 in 2021. They won the Sugar Bowl. Then they came out and they went 5-7 and seven last year. Just a quick side note. I'm interested to see what happens there. But anyway, Mathuti commits to the Ducks. And our class remains at number 8 nationally. Meaning, as we discussed... You probably have to get commitments like this to stay where you are at because Oregon, believe it or not, is not the only school getting commitments in the 2024 cycle right now. So Mathuri commits, nice pickup for the Ducks. They've now got a pair of linebackers in in the 2024 cycle. And something I'm going to ask Brian Smith about uh, more tomorrow is whether or not that affects their their recruitment or the recruitment of Justin Williams, the five-star linebacker. My guess is it does not because Williams is so talented uh, that, that he'd probably be able to go anywhere no matter who else is in is in that room at that position group. He'd probably, probably be able to make an impact right away. But these are two of Oregon's 10 highest rated uh, commits in the 2024 cycle. They're up to 20 verbal commitments at this point in time. Aaron Flowers has actually gotten the... Uh, well, I guess, I, actually, I apologize. Aaron Flowers is listed at the top of Oregon's recruiting class right now, but the rankings on 24-7, I think their site is kind of having having a bug, but re- regardless, you got a bunch of four-star guys uh, in, in the class, and that's what Oregon is looking to have. You got to build your roster, historically speaking, statistically speaking, with four- and five-star recruits up and down at every position group. And going into last weekend, linebacker was a pretty glaring need. I think the number one recruiting need now is probably along the defensive line. Curious what all of you think. Drop them in the YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks as always. But you've kind of filled the linebacker need. You'd still go after a guy like Justin Williams because of his immense talent. And even if he was another four-star linebacker, is there ever such a thing as too much talent? (laughs) Not for my money. I'd rather have too much than too little. That's That'd be a good problem to have. So Mathuti commits. Oregon's got that position pretty short up. I think defensive line, probably your biggest uh, out, outstanding, like a high-end defensive lineman in there. You do have Zadavian Sims, four-star defensive lineman from uh, Durant, Oklahoma, who we got to commit over, over the Sooners. You also have Jackson Jones, four-star from Yuma, Arizona. And then also along the uh, the defensive line, you've got Tione Gray uh, from, from the state of Missouri and Hazelwood Central High School out there. So you do have some guys there. I don't know that you have that big splash impact guy along the defensive line. That's why I think Breland or Nuaneri or um, a guy like Jordan Ross as well would be a really, really nice pickup for for the Ducks uh, going forward. So we'll talk about all that with Brian more on tomorrow's show. All right, back into the mailbag. This from three stars. I don't know why not five stars. I guess that's like showing a little bit of humility there. I respect it. This from the Twitter DMs. July 1st, new president officially started at Oregon. Will there be any changes in sports? First time in Oregon history that the AD was included on the search. Obviously wanted a sports-oriented president and appears he is into sports. He was at the spring game, also from Wisconsin. He was uh, he was there from the Big Ten. Is that a reason too? Never will know. He was really, really liked by many at Wisconsin. All the cooking going on. Thanks. A little bit all over the place there. But the crux of the question here is, Oregon's got a new president. Does that change anything for athletics? 
not tangibly. You know, Oregon as a university would not have hired him if he didn't place a high priority on athletics because Oregon as a university places a high priority on athletics. They're willing to put in the money. They're willing to put in the time. It's part of the culture. They're willing to pay coaches. Like they have the facilities. They have the, the coaches. The history, everything is there. And, you know, Oregon is not exactly the Stanford of the Northwest academically. So this is part of their identity as a university, right? It's part of how you get your name out there to, you know, kids from out of state. Like, hey, I want to go to Oregon. You know, their uniforms look awesome. Their football team is really good. Like, that's a huge draw, right? Athletics are the front porch for your university. I think for the Ducks, it's the front porch and the main entryway. I, I think that's kind of how they approach it. That's at least how I see them marketing that sort of stuff. So I agree. I don't think he would have been brought on if he wasn't a sports guy. Now, the interesting tie here is he has ties to the Big Ten coming over from Wisconsin, which is ironically where our formal president, Michael Schill, went over to Northwestern and is currently dealing with, shall we call it a debacle, with the football program over there for the Wildcats. So the question that comes up in my mind when you say, well, hey, we have a new president, he's coming from the Big Ten. Does that mean Oregon, as a university, is trying to just finagle their way into the Big Ten? If you want to go like half of a tinfoil hat, you could get yourself into that mindset and say, that's what's going to take place or that's what we want. That's why we brought this guy on. I think the, the Occam's razor explanation here is that he was just a qualified candidate who fit the university mission and whatnot and came from a place where they also value athletics, Wisconsin football, Wisconsin basketball. These are big time programs. They have made runs in the NCAA tournament. They have had great football seasons. We've played them in Rose Bowls many times. That's a place that cares about sports. So that, you know, alignment and anything, you know, on the academic front as well might have, uh, you know, suited what, what they were looking for in a candidate. But I don't think from a logistical standpoint with regards to Oregon's future in the Pac-12 versus the Big Ten or anything, I don't think it, it changes anything. I think whether Michael Schill had stayed or now you have, you have Schultz in there, I don't think that that alters the university mentality because the president of, is of course a major power broker at the school right a lot of influence a lot of sway a lot like a lot of people are going to go to him for major decisions but he's not the only one now presidents drive realignment i joke all, all the time on locked on pac 12 that that's going to be written on my gravestone because i'm saying that until every college football fan understands it that presidents vote on realignment. They're not made by athletic directors. So that is 100% true. What is also true is that there, as long as there is a media deal that's viable, is a path to the playoff almost annually, at least you know within reason for Oregon going forward in the Pac-12. And in the Big Ten, could be a lot tougher when you have USC and UCLA over there and Penn State and Michigan and Ohio State. That's a tough road to go through. And I, I think that you can look at the Pac-12 and say, well, Oregon has a chance to be, you know, the flagship football program. You could make a case that they already are in the Pac-12 going forward without USC. That case is actually fairly easy to make. They're the biggest television draw in the conference right now, even with USC. And when USC is removed from the equation, it's pretty clearly Oregon as the top brand, as the top television draw out here in, in, in the Pac-12. And the numbers back that up. So... For the Ducks and the university as a whole, I don't think that this new president is going to come in and you know spark some new desire to be in the Big Ten. I think the answer to the question, would Oregon take an invitation to the Big Ten, is the same today as it was on February 18th or June 30th, 2022, which is, I suspect that they would. I don't want them to. I hope that that never happens. I hope realignment settles the heck down for a little while. It's fun to talk about, but as a college sports fan, I don't actually like it. I don't want USC and UCLA to leave. I don't want Texas and Oklahoma to leave the Big 12. None of that stuff is making college football a better product for me as a diehard, lifelong, more traditional college football fan. So... I think that the Ducks would take a Big Ten offer if it ever came. But just so we're all aware, that offer, 
you, you, you might see people on, on the internet, keyboard warriors out there who can just so readily and available or in a availably, I don't, anyway, English, man, they can readily, my, my guy, Bud is going to send me how I messed that up. He's going to send me a DM about how I messed that up, what I should have said and what words actually mean, which I love anyway. Anybody can readily and confidently type Oregon and Washington are going to the Big Ten. It's going to be done once the Pac-12 deal comes out and it's a disaster. Just so we're all on the same page here, Oregon and Washington have to be desired by the Big Ten, which they do not have a desire for more West Coast schools at this point in time. Also, the Big Ten would have to decide they want Oregon and Washington and want to prioritize athletics with those two schools and ignore the academic component to an extent rather than inviting Stanford and Cal, who would also bring in a major media market in the Bay Area and who bring a lot more academic pedigree combined than Oregon and Washington. So that is not something that is imminent. It is simply not. The Big Ten does not right now want to expand further. Could they? Yes but they aren't, meaning they don't want to, at least not right now. That's why there was a commissioner change too. Kevin Warren went out, Tony Petiti came in because Kevin Warren wanted to go aggressive. He wanted to go nationalized conference. He wanted to go more West Coast schools. And the Big Ten president said, no, thank you. We are good. And he said, okay, then I'm going to leave. That's roughly how that went down is my understanding. So I don't think that that changes anything. And I don't think the Big Ten answer is changing for the Ducks, and I don't think the Big Ten desire uh, changes in a big way with with President Schultz uh, now officially in office for the last uh, 12 days or so. All right, this question about the playoff, which I despise. Not the 14 playoff, the 12 team playoff. Beginner Catholic asks, I t- my guy's an everyday are out there, so we can, we can forgive his semi-oddball name, but honestly, come up with whatever name you want. I like seeing your different names. It's fun. I took a little time off from watching the show and I'm now catching up. You better be. I'm just kidding. I appreciate you no matter what. It is no secret you are not a fan of the expanded playoff. Neither am I. Victory, I have have a friend. Look at that. I have a friend. Uh, And say that it will not bring more parity to college football. It absolutely will not. Do you think it would bring more parity though? Which by the way, he spelled P-A-R-O-D-Y, which is parity as in making a joke of something. The word is parody, P-A-R-I-T-Y. That's Spencer McLaughlin, the grammar shark. So he asks that and says, and then asks, what is the most absurd situation you can imagine with a 12-team playoff? So let's get to the first question first. The notion that a 12-team playoff is going to create more parody, more teams are going to win, more teams are going to have access. I don't care. The FCS has had a 2014 playoff for a long time. I'm going to read you the national champions. <sighs> Let's see. The foot, the, uh, the, FC, the FCS schools, you know, we play one every year, just like everybody gets to and everybody needs to because those schools need money, right? So we play Portland State week one. Anyway, um, North Dakota State, has won the national championship. This is with a 2014 playoff, which would, oh, I mean, just, it would, it would change everything, right? North Dakota State, the most well-run FCS program, have won the national championship in, oh, look at that, uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2021. Does that sound like anybody? Hmm. Let me put my thinking cap on. Does that remind me of anybody? <laughs> oh, that's right. Alabama. But it's a 2014 playoff. They're get- Here's the myth about the 12-team playoff. That because more teams are going to get in, that more teams can now win a national championship. Hogwash. Baloney. A farce completely ridiculous on its face because the formula and ingredients for building a national championship caliber team do not change in a 12-team playoff. 
You have to recruit at a high level. You have to have great coaching. You have to have great players. You got to have NFL players. You got to have some really good role players. You got to have things go right in your season. And your schedule has to set up correctly. All of that. And now the schedule doesn't have to set up quite so correctly for you to get in. But here's the deal. There is no world that I have seen in which a team that can't make it in a 12-game regular season plus conference championships into the top four. And in fact, not even into the top six. Like, I'd be okay with a 16 playoff. I wouldn't love it, but I won't push back on it. I'd be like, okay, yeah, that's fine. You, you want to do that? Okay. Anything beyond six is ridiculous. Because if you can't get into the top five or six teams by the end of the year, there is no world in which you are going to be pulling an upset of the number one team. It's football. This is not basketball. I don't want to hear anything about March Madness because it's a completely different sport. You have five guys that you have to compete with. In football, you have 22. So the gap between the haves and the half-nots is just significantly greater and more difficult to overcome. So no, it would not create more parity. There's never been a year in which... Like, Georgia the last two years. Was the number 10 team going to pull an upset of Georgia? Because numbers 2, 3, and 4 didn't even come close except for Alabama the year before. Nobody came close. Well, Ohio State did actually. But the number 4 team did. And then the number 3 team, or was it number 2, whatever TCU was, yeah, they got blasted. But you're telling me the number 11 team was going to was gonna pull an upset of Georgia. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm not buying that. Uh, what's the most absurd situation you can imagine with a 12-team playoff? Kind of feasible, but also kind of not. But not impossible. The most absurd scenario I can foresee, because you have, in a 12-team playoff, six at-large bids and the six highest-rated conference champions. That's not specifically relegated to the Power 5 leagues, plus one G5, but that's how it's pretty much going to play out every year. So the most absurd situation in 12-team playoff would be the Pac-12, the ACC, and the Big 12 only get one team in each, and that's their conference champion. Then the SEC and the Big 10 would get three each, and then you would have three G5 teams, like the American champion, the Conference USA champion, and the Sun Belt champion, for instance, or the Mountain West champion, right? Pick three G5 leagues, those conference champions all were able to get in there, and that would mean in this weird scenario, you'd have as many G5 teams as you did next three teams, which are the ACC, the Big 12, and the Pac-12. That's what I've kind of dubbed them is. There's the Big 2, Big 10, and the SEC, and there's the next three. So that'd be the craziest thing I could foresee, you know, really happening there in terms of like which teams get in. And then the craziest thing would be somebody not from a power conference winning a national championship, which I don't see happening. Anyway. Uh, let's close with uh, with this fun question. I love these sorts of questions to just wrap up the show, right? Everything's very serious, down to business, talking about the playoff, everything. But sometimes it's nice to just, you know, have a little fun. Plus, I don't mind showing a little of my own uh, personality and thoughts on some things. This question from Little Ray with a bunch of Ys. When it comes to movies, of which I'm a big fan, are you a villain or a hero guy? What's your favorite villain and hero of all time from movies? Love the show, Spence. I hope you do this show for life. Well, first of all, that is a very touching sentiment. And I very much appreciate that. And I love doing the show. I really, really do. I also love movies and superheroes and villains. I didn't have to think long and hard about this because I have the answers just like that. Like Thanos snapping his fingers to destroy half of life in the universe. Just like that. I know it off the top of my head. Favorite superhero, Captain America, diehard fan, all the way. I was Team Cap in Captain America Civil War, which was basically the Avengers Civil War, but, you know, yada, yada, yada. Team Cap, all the way. He is my favorite. I watch his movies the most of anybody in the MCU. Best villain of all time? Easy. Heath Ledger, Joker. Dark Knight, 2008. Greatest superhero movie of all time. I think that's a pretty widely held consensus that The Dark Knight is the best superhero movie of all time, certainly the best trilogy of all time, is Batman Begins, Dark Knight, and Dark Knight Rises. I would then go probably Captain America, those three movies, because they're all so unbelievably good. The Avengers movies are really good. Like that, that's, that's kind of a tough question, a different one. But 
I'm a little bit more on the hero side, but I also understand and very much respect the role that villains play, not just in movies, but in sports, and that you need a good one or you can't create a good film. And those films are reasons why. And all those movies, by the way, love the villains. Red Skull and the First Captain America. The Winter Soldier, fantastic. Civil War, going against each other. And Colonel Zemo, I mean, outstanding. Outstanding character there. And a well-conceived villain. And then in the Dark Knight trilogy, the Joker... Bane, Bane's a close second, by the way. Palpatine's in the mix. He's really good. Uh, you know, Vader's good, but Palpatine's better. Um, but Joker, Heath Ledger, number one villain, best acting performance I have ever seen, ever. Don't know that I'll ever see a better one or that I'll ever move off that stance. And Captain America is my favorite superhero. I love these sorts of questions. Keep them coming. Keep them all coming. YouTube comments or on Twitter. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And go Ducks.